when I begin to think about goodness, um, ah, this is a, I love this series, but when I think, think about goodness, I begin to think about the whole superhero motif. Just, just the whole con, just the way in which I believe the superhero, you know, idea just kind of takes shape. And one of the unique things about it is that, you know, what, what superhero films and comic books and stories do for us, especially for children, is it helps to clearly identify good versus evil, right? It's one of the things that it does. Can I tell you a little secret, something I learned? I love traveling to Seattle. It's my favorite place in the entire world, oddly enough. I love Seattle. I was in Seattle a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, and there's a museum, and it's a museum that talks about, you know, one of the rooms has to do with um, different motifs of film, different genres. And one of the genres, I believe it's either fantasy or something, it talks about how most movies that are in the area of sci-fi fantasy where it's like superheroes or Lord of the Rings or whatever it is, those kind of things, if you notice that there's uniformity in evil and there's diversity in good. So let me give you some examples. Uh, Star Wars, right? Star Wars, look at the uniformity of, you have Darth Vader and all of those guys all look alike, right? So everyone has on the same outfit, but the people who are fighting against the evil are all different. You got the Woogies, and you got, you know, uh, you know uh, Luke Skywalker, you got a male, you got a female, you got a big, you know, whatever that, what's the big thing called? Chewbacca, you got Chewbacca. There's diversity. We look at Lord of the Rings, same thing. You look at Lord of the Rings, the enemies, all the orgs, all look alike, right? They're all kind of just cut the same way. But we look at the good, the good is diverse. So you got hobbits and elves and you got, you know, all these different elements. And so the genre, I think for us, is saying some things that are really specific. And, and in the superhero motif, it's kind of the same thing. In most cases, in fact, one of the greatest scenes, I think, in Age of Ultron, if you saw that, was like the last scene between Ultron and Vision. And they're having a conversation, and what happens in this conversation is Ultron is, in, in, in essence, remarking about the depravity of humanity. And Vision is just saying, you know, yeah, I know that there's some issues in humanity, but I've got faith in them, you know, that just because it's, you know, a child doesn't mean that we ought not be involved. Now, here's what's interesting about that, is that in that, and this, this is like really deep superhero sci-fi. I'm sorry if y'all not into this stuff. <laughs> but I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this kind of stuff, right? But what, but you look at Ultron, Ultron, God, this is, I feel I'm, I'm way too far off in it, but let me just finish. <laughs> you, ever, you ever start telling a story like, I should have stopped a long time ago. But Ultron, if you notice, Ultron kind of embeds himself in all this different machinery. So there's uniformity with Ultron, and then you look at the Avengers, you got the Hulk, you got, you know, Iron Man, you have all these different pieces. And, and in this dialogue, what I believe was happening with Vision and Ultron is that there was this juxtaposition of good and evil of depravity and hope, this balance, but this tension that's balanced where you see the elements of what, what, what is, is never to be or the brokenness of culture, and then you see vision that has this hope. In fact, at the end of Wonder Woman, I'm going to keep going with the judge God, come on with me. At the end of Wonder Woman, remember in Wonder Woman when they're talking about, once again, humanity, and she's like, look, it's not about what they deserve, it's about what I believe. Remember that scene? What was happening there was there was, this, there was this picture that was being given. And in a lot of these superhero genres or, or movies, what you'll find is that what motivates the hero to do heroic stuff is this very fixed ideology around good and evil. This is why, you know, Captain America gets in the plane and drives it into the ocean because it was for the greater good, motivated by what was on the inside of him. And the same thing, Superwoman, the, I can't think of his name, but he drives his plane up into the air and it explodes. Why? The greater good. Something inside of him had these fixed positions of good and evil. And because in their heart there was this fixed position, this, this personal understanding of what good was and what good should be, it, it, it manifested in behaviors. It manifested in a way of life. So hear me very clearly. What I'm suggesting to you is this, is that it is the concept of good as a personal reality that motivates the behaviors of life. And if we're not careful and we try to just subscribe to a set of regulations as a way to attain goodness, we miss the moment and it's not sustainable. Yeah. But it's what we believe about life. Yeah. 
What we believe about God, what we believe about humanity, what we believe about God's design concerning us, that then it works its way out into our behaviors. And what I believe that the superhero kind of element does is it tries to give us a bird's eye view. Now, here's how it does it. To the extent that it says this, if you're willing to put yourself in a position of sacrifice for something that you believe, that may at some point even negatively impact you, but you believe it so deeply and your heart is so committed to it that good is really good, that there is an objective truth about good and good is not relative and good is not just how you see it, but there is good, it does exist and there is a desire for you as a person to live into that truth, how that plays out. One of the fights between Captain America and Iron Man, I'm, I'm just going deeper and deeper is that Captain America had this thing where he felt like Iron Man or, or, or Stark, you know, was unwilling to sacrifice for a greater good. That Stark eventually proved that he was willing to, but that was the demarcation in my mind. That's, that's what he, that was the measurement. Were you willing to say, you know what, good is so good, independent of me, that I'm willing to walk in this way, even if it doesn't seem good to me, if it's for a greater good. Is that making sense to anybody? Yeah. I went down like several paths here. I just hope that that was, that was clear. All right. So people have taken a lot of angles on this goodness, one of the, this, this fruit of the spirit goodness. And the angle that I think is, you know, most accurate is the angle of the goodness in this really being along the lines of personal morality. I really believe that. And let me give you a definition for goodness, what I think. Goodness is holiness in heart and life. And, and, and I say it in that order, and I, and I make that distinction because I want to be, be sure. There are three words I want you to see, holiness, heart, and life. Holiness is, is, now hear me, is just being set apart, sanctified. It's just being moved, right, into a special demarcated place, right? That's holiness is. But holiness now as a position then turns into holiness as an intention of the heart. Before we even get to how that looks in behaviors, how how that works out and what we do and what we say, the the, the deal is this, that once the Spirit of God through his Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit have moved you into a place of being specific, specified, having the Lord's name over you, that then that begins to, to, to take birth and take shape in your heart. Now, I want you to follow this line of reasoning and this line of progression because this line really matters. That first, God moves you to the side. Now, hear very carefully. In most cases, when you are positioned as holy, your heart has to catch up. Now, why am I saying that? Because I think I want to make sure that you understand that the progression or the metamorphic process of personal righteousness is not something that any of us got overnight, any of us is getting overnight. All of us are on a path. All of us have pace. All of us are walking through a season attempting to live out what we have been positionally moved into. Is that making sense? Once you have been positionally adjusted, then your heart starts to catch up. There is a renewing of your mind that manifests in the changing of your heart and intention, the way in which you reason, the way in which you filter reality, your worldview, the way in which you walk out compassion as, as a disposition then begins to modify. Now, having that having its work done in you then begins to live out in your behaviors and your habits. And so all of these are progressive steps. Now, why am I breaking this down? Because I don't want you to give up on yourself. I don't want you to stop short of what God can do in you because you believe that you're a lost cause or it's taking you longer than you would like it to take. The fact is, all of us, and we don't talk about this. We don't talk about this. We often don't really celebrate this. And most people won't tell you they're junk. Everybody in this room... Every single body in this room is on a journey. Watch this. Everybody's got junk in their past and junk in their present. Every single person in this room. Every single one. People try to act all pious and biased and uppity and saint. Listen to what I'm saying. And I'm not trying to hate on them like to make it a problem, but sometimes I think what happens is when you come into a place and people are phony and pretending, you start to feel like an outsider, like you're crazy. 
And I just want to help you understand, you're not crazy, you're on a journey. And everybody else is too. But it is progressive. God shifts you as a position. He calls you righteous because of his son. Then your life on the inside begins to materialize that righteousness, and then it begins to play out in how you make decisions. Am I talking good this morning? But this element is a super human, is super hero. Because in a lot of contexts, there are a lot of people who are just not after what you're after. Here's my assumption. I might be wrong, but I don't think I am. If you're here right now, it's because you're after something. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to be here. Yeah. You didn't have, you don't, here, here's the deal. It's not even culturally like taboo not to go to church anymore. It's okay. See, there was a time in our history where you didn't go to church. It's like, well, what's wrong with you? Now it's like, you don't go to church. Let's go to the beach. It's all good, right? <laughs> People don't even care anymore. I'm not, you know, right? Am I, being, am I right? Am I wrong? Your friends don't be like, you didn't go to church? What kind of, you know, nobody says that anymore. You know what I'm saying? Right. So the fact that you show up, here's what I sent. You're after something. You want something. You're putting yourself in position for God to say something to you, to challenge your thinking, to bring you further, to take you deeper, to lift you higher. That's a blessing. Right? That's a huge blessing. Right? So with that being the case, here's how, now I'm going to be honest with you. I, I struggled this a little bit from the standpoint of trying to find the best way to capture this for the purposes of what's going to be most fruitful for you. And here's what, I, here's what I came up with. My sense is I want to take an angle on this, looking at goodness or holiness or godliness at, from the standpoint of proficiency. Come on. Right? That the deposit, in other words, these fruit of the Spirit are the characteristics that are the outgrowth of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Here's my, here's, and, and, and this can be debated for years. Here's my, my disposition. It, it is born in us in an infancy stage. Fruit nowhere on the planet exists whole, complete, and fully ripened. Right? Nowhere. You, you find a fruit that just shows up already ready to be eaten? I'm going to tell you something. Don't eat that fruit. It is genetically modified and will kill you eventually. <laughs> right? But fruit grows. It starts as a seed. It grows, right? So I look at goodness, or righteousness, holiness, in the same context as, hear me, as, as this is the bad terminology, but it just kind of follow my, my line of reasoning, as raw talent that needs to be developed in you. Right? So there are four questions that, that here, here, now when it comes to goodness, when it comes to holiness in heart and life, I think there are four questions that you ought to ask yourself as it relates. Now here's question number one. The question is, um, how is this fruit being informed? How is it being informed? No, how is it being resourced? How is it being, how are you positioning this fruit to grow in your life? Are you, see, are you hearing what I'm saying? Like, like, here's the deal. Life is really simple. What you put in is what you get out. It's, I mean, there's, there's no simpler kind of manifestation, progression of seed time and harvest than that. So if, if you're not resourcing this fruit of goodness, if you're not finding information that, that will pour into and help develop this, this fruit of goodness, then it, it stands to reason that you're going to have a longer process and it's going to be more difficult than it needs to be. So, so you hear what I'm going to say? So you, how are you informing? How are you, how are you resourcing this fruit in you? Yeah. Is that making sense? Yeah. It's not making sense. Let me say it this way. In other words, if you're saying to yourself, you want to be an engineer, the question becomes, where have you put yourself positionally that it might give you the information, right. resources, and intel to, to, to progress you towards your ultimate goal, right? If you want to be a kinesiology, you can't go to basket weaving class, right? A, a, a kinesiologist, right? If you want to be a dancer, you going to take drum lessons is not going to help you. Am I breaking this down basic enough? And sometimes my challenge is this, and, and sometimes we think that by some 
Osmosis, we're just going to understand what holiness looks like without in any way resourcing ourselves or gaining the necessary intel to produce that in our lives. Make sense to you? Here's number two. How is it contextualized? Right? Here's what I mean. If you're putting yourself in environments where the people around you and the environment you're in is not sowing into your personal success, then how do you expect to get where you want to be? In other words, the Bible says, I want to say 1 Corinthians says this, it says bad company corrupts good character. Does that make sense to you? I want to make it really, really, really plain. If you're going to be a superhero, you need super friends. A little bit. Right? You need a super friend. Like Iron Man is not hanging out with like Jim. <laughs> like where are you going, Tony Stark? I'm going to hang out with Jim. Who's Jim? Just a random guy at the corner store. You know who Iron Man's friend is? The Incredible Hulk. <laughs> He's incredible. Iron Man has incredible friends. And I think one question you have to ask yourself is if you're going to walk, this one is a heavy lift. If you're going to walk on a level in which you're able to operate in the superhero element of goodness, holiness, you need people who are walking that way. Okay, next one. Number three is how is it practice? <laughs> what are you rehearsing? What are you rehearsing? One of the things I think that we sometimes maybe fail to realize is the importance of literally, in other words, anything worth doing is worth doing bad at first. Let me say it. Anything worth doing is worth doing bad at first. Practice. Practice. You know what I'm saying? You, you have to ask yourself this question. What am I, what am I rehearsing? What, 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 what do I allow to take up, you know, the majority of my time? Okay, here's the next one. Last one is, is it analyzed? If it, when it comes to this idea of goodness and righteousness, holiness, and all of these things, are you asking yourself tough questions? Are you analyzing? Are you doing self-inventory? Are you being reflective? Now, I want to be careful with this because I want to help you understand. This is not morbid introspection. This is not you and I looking at ourselves and just every single day like, oh, well, I'm so terrible. It's not that. But, but, but if, if we're not assessing where we are in life, looking at where we've come from, the things that we've done or haven't done, the way in which life is processing, if we're not kind of taking inventory, I'm going to tell you something. People will help you take inventory of your life. Intentionally or unintentionally? When you like it and when you don't. You ever have somebody say something to you that just ruins your day? And what I mean is they spoke a truth and you were like, oh my God, who am I? Um, it just cut you and they didn't mean no harm by it. They weren't trying to hurt you, but they were just like, hey, how you know, whatever. It's like, oh, well, so today's a good day, huh? I guess. And you're like, what does that mean? What am I, is, is yesterday a bad day? What? Right? You start looking, you start thinking about your life. Right? Here's the deal. My, my thing is this. That's a good thing. It's a good thing for you to ask yourself questions, to analyze where you are, to think deeply about, you know, the proficiency of your life. Because the truth is this. If you're not asking questions, guess what, what's, what's also not happening? You're not getting answers. <laughs> and if you're not getting answers and there's not an honest assessment, then none of us can make progress. None of us can get to where God wants us to be if we're not willing to put ourselves in a position to be honest about where we are. Sometimes the issue is this. We don't take an honest account of our capacity. We don't really look at our, The reason why we sometimes can't get to a place is because we don't think that there's anything we need to be thinking about. We're just going through life, and all of us either have this friend or we are this friend that we're just moseying through life, and we're just reckless and thoughtless, and people around us saying, I can't believe that he doesn't understand that. And the truth is, it's because we're not spending the time really asking ourselves honest questions. I love Dr. Phil, and he says, how's that working for you? 
And we don't stop to ask that question. We, we, we get upset about what's, what's, being, what's being produced in our lives, but we never ask the question of how we got there. We never say, wait a minute, you know what? Maybe this is my fault. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I'm walking in the spirit of offense. Maybe it's not that deep and they're not talking about me. Maybe I'm just in my, I'm a little deluded about what I think should or shouldn't be happening. Whew, this is going down so hard. (laughs) So, having said that. Turn to your Bibles to Psalms, or Psalms, uh, the first division of Psalms. So here's the first thing. The first thing, here, here are the four ways I believe that goodness, as, as once I said, it's a proficiency that can be developed. So I think you can get gooder. Come on. It's all right. I do. There's, there's a member, I don't know, she, she goes to the Lamb Church, she, she says, Pastor, you just keep getting gooder and gooder preaching that word. And I say, Poppy Kylie, yes, I do. No, but, but I think that we can get gooder. I, what's wrong with, is that, you know what I mean when I say it. We can get gooder, and I think there's a way we can get gooder, and there are four ways. There are four, what, y'all pay attention. Jehovah. There are four ways you can get gooder if, if I believe if we apply these four things to our lives, and this superhero strength, you know, can really grow in us. The first one, go, go, go back, we'll go back to the scripture really quickly. Um, uh, Psalms, Division 1, there we go. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, um, take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Now watch this. Here's the, the, the first way is by revelation. I believe that to the extent that we are open to revelation, that it allows for us to develop this superhuman strength of, of being gooder. And here's what I mean. Whether it's through the preach word, has anybody, I was, I've listened to a sermon, uh, uh, I, I, I go to church on Sunday mornings before I come in here. Every Sunday morning I watch another church and, and hear the gospel preached to me literally every single week. And there's some weeks where the word that's being preached just breaks me down. I mean, I'm just listening to the gospel and it's just, it just hits Right at a point, just yeah. at a point. Thank God for live stream, you know, at, at different churches because I get to hear the gospel, come here and preach the gospel. But as I'm sitting there, sometimes where the Lord is just putting his finger right in my chest, right? Is there anybody here that's ever heard the preach gospel that's just, just got your number, just called your name, just you felt like whoever was preaching what nobody else in the room. They would, the Lord was just talking to you. And so that, that's revelation knowledge, that the word of God is revealed by preaching. And you hear, so here's why, here, fam, listen, and, and I, would, I would love to say you have to come to church, and I would love to say that, but I can't say that per se in the same way when I'm about to say this next point. The point is this, get the, the preaching of the gospel. Yeah. Even if you're not here on a Sunday morning, you, you'll, you'll never know the impact of the gospel being preached in your life until you don't have it anymore. And I'm talking about good word. I'm not just talking about some random dude that's just trying to whatever. I'm saying pre- the, the word of God. It is something about the revelation of the word of God that changes. The Bible says this. It says that it's, it's not hanging out with sinners and see the mocks, whatever, but, but who meditate when the word of God. Yeah. When the word of God, and, and, and you're in that space day and night, when you're allowing for that word to take up root on the inside of you, it literally begins to perform in you what you can. The, the Lord will begin to strip you of certain appetites. You even know when they left. But it's that gospel, it's the word being preached, right? It's personal study in the word. It's you reading your Bible. It's you reading even other books that substantiate or help to unpack the word of God for you. Yeah. It's you having a personal devotion and study life. Something about that, that revelation that comes from you spending time in the word of God, child of God, it literally begins to perfect you. Yeah. It begins to change you. It changes, watch this, not just, it didn't just change what you think about, but it changes how you think about it. Yes. Yes, it does. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Right? Something about meditating on the Word. 
the revelation that comes, that there are times in life where it, it, you can't get it from anywhere else but just a download from the Spirit. Where the Spirit will just quicken your heart, will point out something, will show you yourself, will show you something, and will just challenge you at your core. So revelation is a huge way in which the, the superhuman or superhero you know, strength of goodness can grow you. Here's number two. Go in your Bibles. Well, okay. Put the scripture up. <laughs> the second scripture up. All right. <laughs> That's in red because Jesus said it. That's why it's in red. <laughs> Simon says Luke 22. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as, uh, as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Here's what Jesus said. Satan has decided to sift you as wheat, and, and part of this is actually going to work. Because you're going to play me. You are. What Satan wants you to do, he wants you to walk away. He wants you to disconnect. He wants you to deny me. He wants you to turn your back. Right? Now, here's the deal. But I pray for you, watch this, that his ultimate plan won't work. Now watch this. Number two, another way in which goodness grows in us is personal failure. Personal failure. Now, I'm, now I, you might not like this, agree with this, but I'm going to say it. I'm the type of guy that I don't believe that every kid who participates should get a medal. People don't like that. I know in this new culture. I grew up where they were winners. I grew up where they kept scoring games, and I know a lot of the, and here's the, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a therapist, so I may be, have no depth of field on this, and there might be some great compelling arguments to get this, against this. I'm just saying, I feel like there's something about having to lose that teaches you how to lose the right way if you got the right people helping you navigate the fact that in life sometimes you lose. Everybody don't need a ribbon. Everybody don't need a gold star. This guy was better than you. Shake his hand. Tell him congratulations. Right? Here's a, now, but here's the difference. I want to make a distinction. The difference is this, is that there's a big difference between having a person of failure and being a person of failure. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, look, you're going to lose. You're going to do what the enemy wants. But how you handle the aftermath determines the metal of a man. You follow what I'm saying? And the fact is, he's saying, look, when you are, listen, there's an after. You're going to get through this. And when you do, don't let this be wasted. But strengthen the next dude's coming behind you. So watch this. I believe one of the ways in which we grow and are developed is when we lose sometimes. When we fail, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to miss it. You're going to say the wrong thing. You're going to do the wrong thing. It's going to happen. Right? I'm not prophesying over you. I'm just, we live in life and you're a human being. <laughs> I don't have to be a prophet to tell you that you will make mistakes in life. It's not a prophetic word. That's reality. Right? You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. You're going to come up short. But how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? Do, do, do you pick up your stuff and go home? Do you, do, 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 you, do you tuck your tail and run? Do you give up? Do you walk away? Or do you say, Lord, even in this failure, even in this moment where I'm embarrassed or ashamed or I failed you or disappointed, I will not die in this season. But look, I'm going to learn from this season that the next time I come around this way, I'll know how to handle where I am right now. Is that making sense to you? Here's the next one. Put up the scripture. The Bible says in Hebrews 3, it says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from, the, that's a really long, y'all just bear with me, um, the living God. Go faster. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction from the very end. And as has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were with, uh, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? Now stop right there. Go to chapter 4, family. Go to chapter 4. I'm going to start right at verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. 
For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Verse 3. Okay, stop right there. Let me just do this. I've got a little bit of time. Here, here's the deal. What this is talking about is the fact that the gospel was preached at the time that Moses and the Egyptians and the Israelites were in, coming out of Egypt, the word was given to them, and they had unbelieving hearts. And because of their unbelieving hearts, what the word shows us is that an entire generation died in the wilderness. You hearing this? Right? They had unbelieving hearts. They would not speak. They were murmurers. They were complainers. They were critical. Their heart, they were, the Bible says they were hard-hearted. And because of that, they all died in the wilderness. Not just died. They, they were killed in the wilderness. Right? Because of their rebellion. Produced out of, out of doubt. Watch this. So here the scripture says this. So, he says this. Don't be like them. That's what it says. Listen. He said, because the same gospel... That's preached to you, was preached to them, but in them it was not mixed in faith. Was it? Say, don't you let what happened to them happen to you. So here's number three. Number three is it, it grows. Number three because of other people's experiences. Listen, the man in the hole might have something to offer you about how to stay out of it. Just maybe. Just maybe. And there's some things that you and I don't have to go through if we pay attention to other folk who did. You follow what I'm saying? And there's some seasons, some issues in life, some things that we're experiencing in life, and we don't have to because somebody already made that mistake. Someone already had that failure. Someone already went down that road. Yeah. And to the extent that we could pay attention. Now hear me, not scornfully, not scoffing, not making fun, not being insensitive, but paying attention to the misgivings, mistakes, misjudgments of other people. Say, you know what, Lord? I see what happened there. Let me get my situation together because I don't want to have to go the same way that they went. Yeah. Preach, yeah. pastor, yeah. Yeah. There's some of you right now that can learn a lot from some people that you're in fellowship with Amen. if you just watch their lives. Yes. Just watch their lives. Watch the good stuff, absolutely, but watch the mistakes. Once again, not, not like with your nose in the air, but like just sensitive, saying, you know what, man, I see how that goes. I can see, or even saying, listen, tell me about the four or five steps that led to that. Yeah. Right? Because watch this. We all understand the hole. What we don't understand is what's right before it that made you keep walking when the hole was there. So help me see what you maybe missed so that when I pass this way, I don't have to fall into what you fell into. Here's the last one and I'm done. Scripture, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, 25, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Here's number four, is the way in which we can grow in goodness is encouragement from others. Amen. Can I say something to you really quickly, family? Please hear what I'm saying. Listen very carefully to me. The reason the enemy wants to bring division and disunity and contention, and he wants to bring, you know, pre pretense into the family of God is, th is this very thing right here. Because the enemy knows the benefit that you are to one another. He knows it. He knows that if we ever had good relationships, we could be a blessing to each other in seasons of challenge. So what does he do? What does he do? He puts enmity between you and I. He puts drama between you and I. He gives you a cantankerous spirit. He gives me a cantankerous spirit. He gives, puts bitterness in you or resentment or whatever it might be or, you know, side-eyeing and looking this and this and thinking that you're better than somebody else or thinking that, oh, wait, why? That, that's not the end game. The end game is keeping this from happening. Because here's what he knows, that the body of Christ was given to us as a gift. I am a gift to you. You are a gift to to me. That you hear me, family, that you and I, literally our assignment toward each other is to encourage and to spur each other to good works and good deeds to live lives that are pleasing to God. But here's the 
real. When I can't talk to you, now I know I've said this before, and I know it maybe comes off a little weird, but here's the deal. There are people that could, you know, if, if, if Sister Mama's dress is too short, right? But every time you see Sister Mama, you ain't got nothing good to say. Or you don't talk to her at all. Or, or, or the word out on you is that, you know, you kind of, you know, you know. When that's the word on you, the minute you step to Sister Mama, she ain't got nothing for you. She can't hear you. She can't hear you. If, if, if uh, you know, old mother so-and-so maybe has a spirit, you know, maybe her little attitude's a little different, or maybe she's a little sharp with her tongue, but you some young whippersnapper and you kind of got a sharp tongue too, when you come trying to tell her about her tongue, she can't, she, see you, she can't hear from you. You hear what I'm saying? When brother so-and-so may not act in the way you think he ought to be acting, but you know, there's no relationship there. You've made no effort. You have no intention to connect, but when you see something happening wrong, all of a sudden you got all this interest in him. He can't, he see you coming, he ain't got nothing for you. And part of the problem, I don't think, hey, this is me, I could be wrong about it. I'm often wrong, clearly, because <laughs> no one ever agrees with what I'm saying when I'm preaching. You always sit on me, you don't ever clap right? No one ever says amen when I'm preaching, so I must be wrong. I'm joking. I'm really good at this. All right. <laughs> I don't believe that most people don't want nobody to tell them nothing. I don't believe that. I don't, I just, I don't believe in my core that people are just like waiting to shut you down. Not in general. There are people who are like that. I, I'm not saying that doesn't exist. But I think in general... People that I have relationship with, I've been able to tell them hard things, and they've been able to tell me hard things. And some things, I had a buddy several years ago, we are having a conversation, I was just, you know, we're just jaw jacking, we're just talking, we ain't really, you know, we're just shooting the breeze. And he went down the path and challenging me on something very deep that was hurtful to him about me, and it was, it was so hard to hear. But he was my friend. So you know what? I'm, I'm listening, and I allow for that to transform me instead of breaking our relationship. And what I believe is this, is that most of you are like that. Not everybody, of course. Some people are not. But most of you, if a friend comes to you, someone who has proven love to you, right? I honestly believe that when you look at the gifts of, this, of the fruit of the Spirit, when someone has walked in love and carries joy and has kindness and is patient, when they talk to you, you're like, I can hear that. You follow what I'm saying? And I think that we are a gift to each other if we would just process our engagement a little bit differently. And I believe that there's some people in the household of faith that I, and, and I, I hate to say that, I'm wondering if I'm right about this, but hear me out, that their growth is stunted because they don't have the benefit of the family of God to help say, hey, why don't you try it this way? Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? Why don't you think about it like this? And I believe that sometimes not having that, that's why I'm such a big proponent of life groups. Because I feel like that space, when you build relationship, people in that group can say some things that they couldn't necessarily say in other environments. Does that make any sense to anybody besides me? Are you following what I'm saying? And I believe that if we're going to be gooder, it's going to take us being a real family. Because family can say hard stuff because there's a bedrock of love. Deposits of affection, compassion of love have been made so that when I say difficult things, you're open. You may not like it in the moment, but your heart is open to hear it. And if it's done in a way that honors God and honors me and leave me my dignity when you speak to me. Are you following what I'm saying? If I'm not robbed of my self-worth by, by being attacked by someone, then I am open to hear and I can grow because of the conversation. This is my challenge. I believe that we all are on a path and a journey, and I believe that God has given us the family of God to aid in that process. The fact is, to live a life of goodness and godliness is not normal. It's not. Right? The Bible says we are born in the sin shaped in iniquity. We all have a bend, a proclivity, something. We all, as I've said this before, the songwriter said, we are all prone to wonder. Prone to leave the God that we love. It is, it is, hear me family, even saved folk are tempted 
to what? Like this whole idea that somehow the eradication of will takes place, no volition is there, and you're just gonna live just and nothing ever. But that's foolishness. Good say, folk, sometimes can be drawn, pulled, led, snared, shackled, gaffled. We call it a dope fiend when young folks say that. Got dope fiend by the enemy. Just you didn't see it coming. Good save folk. Right? But the goodness of God is saying this. But listen, revelation. Stay in the word. Stay in position where you can hear the word. Right? When you make mistakes, pay attention. When you make mistakes, pay attention. Don't let them defeat you. Learn from them. Fail forward. Look at people around you. See what's happening that's wrong or right and learn, glean something from it, and then find yourself safely situated within the family of God because we are a gift to you. Sometimes it may be hard to hear, it may not feel the best, but if we do it right and whoever the we is, we are a gift to you. We are not your enemy, but we love you and see your destiny and vice versa. And the Spirit of God has called us for each other to be a blessing that we might spur each other toward good deeds and good works. Everybody stand up. Do me a favor. Just turn to someone and say, you. Y'all got to participate. Say it again. Say, you can be Gooder. 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 You can be gooder. I can be gooder. Let me say it like this. I don't, I don't care how good you already think you are. Because <laughs> some of you are like, no, I can't. I'm so good. There's no gooder for me. You can be gooder. holiness of heart and life that God has set you apart that it begins to change your heart and then it begins to be expressed in your habits right in your behaviors some of you are kind of you know you're down on yourself because you're you have a habit or you have something that you're like man I can't beat that thing what I'm saying is don't give up on yourself don't I know you're I know you're tired of fighting that fight you know whether whatever maybe you know I, I'm not even going to name things sometimes we like to name just the high but it's a whole lot of stuff that a lot of us are fighting internally, externally, in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirit. A lot of stuff, sins of the flesh and the spirit. So much stuff that we're just fighting. We're ensnared and we're entangled. And it's a battle. I'm saying don't give up. The worst thing you can do is give up on yourself. You're on a road. You're on a journey. And God's plan for you is good. And it may take longer than you want. But please don't give up. My dad often tells a story of, of young people at the Wadsworth Church of God and how they would come to the altar and some remarks, oh, why do you keep coming to the altar? Almost like, they, you should have it figured out by now. And I believe it was Sarah Fractious. I don't know for sure. It might have been her who said something like, let them come yeah. as long as it takes. Yeah. And I'm going to say to your family, it may be an arduous road. And you may look at the destination of God's intention towards you and where you stand in comparison, and you may weep because of disappointment in yourself or how far you feel like the margin is. Don't give up. The, long may be, the, 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 the road may be long, but it is worth it, and you will get there. Now, hear me very clearly. There's never a there of perfection you arrive at in this earth, right? It is not until... That which is perfect has come that we should then be changed and know as we are known. But you can get better. You can get better. You can get better. And goodness can grow in you. If you will apply some, and, and it's not the full measure of there are other things that you can apply, but at least these four things, I think if you can apply these things, stay in your word, pay attention, right? Pay attention. Look around. Use the household of faith. Ask questions. I promise you, this fruit will grow faster than you think. Faster than you think. All right. That's it.
Lift your hands. Father, we thank you. Thank you because you love us. For so long, we've thought that <laughs> you were out to get us. We were in sin and even in righteousness, Lord God, still struggling with the remnants of it. We just always felt under accusation, always felt under condemnation. But God, your intention has never been to, to get us. Your intention has been to bring us, to invite us, to love us into your design for us. And sometimes that does hurt. Sometimes it, it does feel awkward, and sometimes we are often dismayed by our own progress, Lord God, but you love us so much that you never give up. You said such an audacious thing in your word. You said that you were wed, married, even to a backslider. My God. That you would associate yourself with someone was fallen from grace. What an amazing truth. So God, I pray that we will make an investment. We would take your desire for us to walk in righteousness seriously. We repent of all of our mistakes, misgivings, misjudgments, bad decisions, Lord God, and that we will make a fresh and a new, Lord God, attempt, Lord God, to, to do the homework. Yeah. To do the homework, Lord. To put in the real work to be what you've called us to be. And so, Father, I pray as these your people stand here, everyone in this room may be in a different place, all thinking about different things, thinking about decisions in their lives, Lord God, thoughts in their minds. So I pray as they make where they stand a place of prayer, repentance, confession, and forgiveness, that you would meet them right there. Those watching by live stream who have heard this gospel, Lord, and who have been challenged, I pray right where they are that you, Lord God, would let that place be a place of repentance, confession, forgiveness, that they would offer up a prayer, maybe even silently, Lord, you're not out to embarrass anyone, but offer up a prayer saying, Lord, I'm ready. I want to be better. I want to take a step. I want to be the, the best version of myself. I want to walk, Lord, as a holy person in heart and in life. I made so many mistakes, walked down so many bad roads, Lord God, but I know you love me because if you didn't love me, you wouldn't have sent me this word. So this proves that you're not done. So God, in this moment, we all just silently, just whatever it might be, you just offer up a prayer right now. Your Holy Spirit does the work, Lord God. So just silently, we just offer up a prayer right now. We just talk to you ourselves. Forgive us. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for, for, for thinking the wrong thing, for seeing the wrong thing, for saying the wrong thing, for hearing the wrong thing. For just, we're sorry, Lord. We're so sorry. We're, we're so sorry. We're sorry. Not out of fear, Father, but out of love. Out of the eternal love you have for us, Lord. You are for us, God. So we open up our lives and we say, Lord, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit in us. Renew a right spirit in us. Cast us not away from your presence and don't take your spirit from us. <laughs> Thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much. There may be those that are here right now, Lord, that are not saved today. They've never given their heart and life to you. They've never laid down the reins of their life and allowed for you, Father, to have full control. So now, God, for those who are not saved, we pray this prayer. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We believe that you sent him to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, that he died, was buried, and on the third day rose with all power and is now seated in the throne room at the right hand of God. So we confess our sins. Every sin, Lord God, every decision, we confess unrighteousness, Father God, and we ask you to come into our hearts. We ask you to be our Lord and Savior. We ask you to take full control. We will follow you to the ends of the earth. We will serve you. We will learn of you. We will be your disciple, Jesus, and we will make disciples, Jesus. If you prayed that prayer in your heart, 
and you weren't saved, you're saved right now in Jesus' name. Would you give God praise for salvation right now? If you prayed that prayer either in this room or you prayed that prayer or received that prayer on live stream, you're saved by faith. That's it. There's, there's, no, there's no small print. You're saved. If you believe Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and you asked him into your life, you are saved. It, it just confess and believe. That's what the word says. Now, if you've done that, there's a lot of great work to do, a lot of fun work to do in, in information and learning and growing. So we have some great environments um, none of which, unfortunately, are online right now. All of them are on our campus. So if you're watching, I would love to meet you. Come on in. But we have something called Start 2, which is an opportunity for you to understand what it means to be saved, to understand all the details, the foundations of our faith, uh, to understand who God is, who Jesus is, the Holy Spirit, salvation, eternal damnation, the fall from all of that stuff. We'll walk you through every detail. And the, the great thing is that it's like a guided discussion. So you get to ask questions throughout the entirety of that si series and learn as much as you want to learn. Then we have something called Activated. So if you haven't heard of it, it's an opportunity for you to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. The foundations of faith are good in that you are prepared for glory and you have information. But what makes you a real Christian is that you are discipled, right? So what comes from your life? In other words, how you live on this earth. So we have Activated that happens right now. Same thing. It's a guided discussion. It allows for you to ask questions about what it means to, to study the Word of God, what it means to worship, what it means to serve, what it means to be generous, what it means to be evangelistic. All of those details. We're going to give you all the information you need. We'll give you everything you need. This is like a one-stop shop. We can give you everything you need to walk in this life of holiness and righteousness and goodness and glory that you can be better at doing this thing called life. So I want to invite you, if you gave your life to Jesus, to be a part of it. Amen? Amen. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest from the Bible with us now, henceforth and forevermore. And the people of God shouted amen. God bless you.